children will come forward. We will have a celebration of our children. Thank you. Yeah. 
So the Samaritans and the Jews didn't like each other very much, but the Samaritan was the only one who stopped and helped. This is a parable Jesus told to let people know that everybody is our neighbor. The Bible says that the thing to do for eternal life is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the lawyer who was asking Jesus this question said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus told that story to let them know that everybody is our neighbor. <laughs> everybody. So Mr. Rogers kind of had something going on, didn't he? He knew that the whole world was his neighbor. Wait, what? So what does that mean? If everybody's our neighbor, how do we treat people who maybe aren't like us or people we don't like normally or people who are from other countries? Or how do we treat them? We treat them like neighbors? What does that mean? Treat them like how you want to be treated. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's what Jesus told us to do. Treat them like we would want to be treated ourselves. Let's pray for us, bro. Dear God, help us to remember that the whole world is our neighborhood. Help us to treat others as we would like to be treated.
few weeks ago, as I was finishing up a bike ride, I noticed two women kneeling in the street. One was an older woman who had obviously tripped on the curb, and she fell and hit her mouth, which was bleeding a little bit. I stopped and asked if she needed help. She had a friend of her, and a friend asked if I could assist her in helping the woman stand up. So I hopped off my bike, took one arm, and a friend took the other, and we helped the woman stand. I told them I just lived right on the corner if they wanted to come rest or needed some help. The woman said she just needed to get to a car and that she was resting in it. She thought she'd be fine to drive home. So I picked up a purse, which had fallen in the street, and a friend and I helped her walk to the car, which is right across the street. And she assured me she was okay, so I hopped back on my bike and headed on home. I didn't really feel like I did all that much, but I guess you could say I was a good Samaritan that day. You know, the story of the Good Samaritan is probably one of the most best, you know, best known parables in the Bible. I mean, how many of you have heard of someone referred to as a Good Samaritan? The term Good Samaritan is synonymous with being a thoughtful friend, lending a hand to those in need, and helping others before yourself. Many hospitals have the name Samaritan in their name. The Samaritans is a charity which is dedicated to suicide prevention. prevention. Samaritan's Purse has helped lead the needs of people who are victims of poverty, natural disasters, disease, famine, for the purpose of sharing God's love. We even have so-called Good Samaritan laws designed to protect those who aid the victims. The standard interpretation of this, of this story is that we are to be Samaritans, someone who comes to the aid of another. We are to help the sick, the poor, the disenfranchised. What's not to like about helping a stranger and being charitable toward others? But is this really what Jesus was getting at in this parable? This is not the message that a first century Jewish audience would have heard. They didn't need a parable to tell them to care for others. They were already commanded to love both the neighbor and the stranger. The lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? According to one theologian, this is the wrong question. The verb do suggests a single limited action. The lawyer is thinking of something to check off his to do list. Recite a prayer, offer a sacrifice, drop off a box of mac and cheese for the food drop. The lawyer asks a question that cannot be answered when does not do anything to inherit eternal life. The lawyer is trying to trick Jesus, but Jesus turns the question back on the lawyer, evading the trick and answer. But what do you think? And the lawyer answers, as we heard, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's correct. Do this and you shall live. Where would the lawyer wise, he would thank Jesus and go on his way and live his life. But instead, he follows up with another question, once again trying to cheat, trick Jesus, ask him, and who is my neighbor? What he really wants to know is who is not my neighbor. What are the limits? And Jesus replies from the beginning of this story, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell on the robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. We know nothing about the man. He could be rich or poor, free or slave, free or slave. He had been robbed not only of his possessions, but of his dignity, his health. And almost his life. Jesus' listeners would have had no trouble identifying the victim. They may have been victims of the tax themselves. Identifying him, they can only hope that rescue will come. And because they identify with the victim, as they listen to Jesus share the story, they would have been asking themselves, Who would help me? Now, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is notoriously dangerous. The road ran through narrow, narrow passes and points, and the terrain offered easy hiding for bandits who terrorized travelers. Because of its importance, one always goes up to Jerusalem, and going down is leaving it. So priests and Levites did have an obligation to obey laws, which would make them originally clean, suitable for prestigious tasks for serving the <coughs> But if you listen to the parable, although I believe heard the reason why they walked on by is because they needed to remain really originally pure. But they were not going toward Jerusalem. They were going down. They were going away from Jerusalem, which meant they weren't going to the temple, and they didn't 
then leave to, you know, when they originally originally clean. So since there's a rich Jewish tradition of that compassion, all Jews knew that respect that helps them. So our priest is, is an ordinary priest who does what is very ordinary. He fails to act, as does the Levite. The law required both men to attend to the man in the ditch, whether alive or dead. For one is to love neighbor and love the stranger. No excuse would have been acceptable. It actually wouldn't have been inexcusable if they didn't need to remain ritually clean. I said ritually clean. They were obligated to help the neighbor. They were obligated to save a life, and they failed. Saving a life is so important in Jewish law that it mandates and it overrides every other concern, including keeping the Sabbath. Possibly the best explanation that I found for the refusal of the priest and the Levite to come to the aid of the man in the ditch comes from Mark 15, Jim. And he preaches, I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible these men were afraid. And so the first question that the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Samaritan came along and he reversed the question. If I did not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Now, if a Levite and priest only thought about themselves and not the man in the ditch, why did Jesus even speak of them? When good but poor fashion, the duo anticipates the appearance of the third figure, the rule of three. For Jesus' audience, the third of the group would be obvious. Mention a priest and a Levite, and anyone who knows anything about Judaism will know that the third person will be an Israelite. Surprised by the priest and the Levite's lack of compassion, the audience would presume that the third person would be an Israelite and he would come and help. However, instead of anticipating Israelite, the third person in Jesus' story, the one who stops to help, is a Samaritan. Jeff mentioned Samaritans and Jews didn't really get along. To a Jew, any Samaritan was a classic villain. Jews and Samaritans detested each other. To most Jews in Jesus' world, the character represents an enemy. Samaritans were all too familiar neighbors and all too hated enemies. Putting the words neighbor and Samaritan in the same sentence would seem to Jesus' audience like a contradiction in terms. Jesus' listeners would have been surprised and probably offended that the Samaritan became the hero of the story. New Testament scholar A.J. Levine suggests an avenue into experiencing the scandal. She says, to hear the parable in contemporary terms, we should think of ourselves as a person in the ditch and then ask, is there anyone from any group about whom we'd rather die than acknowledge? She offered help or he showed compassion. Nor is there any group who consumer might rather die than to help us. If so, then we know how to find the modern equivalent for the spirit. In a lecture on this parable, before an audience could experience the horrors of September 11th firsthand, A.J. suggested that the one who provided who proved to be neighbor was a member of al -Qaeda. When the lawyer at the end of the story realizes he, and not Jesus, the one who's being put to the test, he manages to say the one who proved neighbor is the one who showed mercy. He cannot even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. His refusal to order to utter the Samaritan as his answer underscores the parable's deep defense. The Samaritan's compassion has become for many the focus of how we interpret the parable. We, like the Samaritan, should show compassion on those who are mistreated. But to understand the parable as did its original audience, we need to think of Samaritans less as oppressed but benevolent figures and more as enemy, as those who do the oppressing. From the perspective of the man in the ditch, Jewish listeners might balk at the idea of receiving aid from the Samaritan. The idea of a good Samaritan would make no more sense than the idea of a good thief or bandit or a good murderer. And what makes a Samaritan good? 
He is never called good in the story itself. We've given the title Good Samaritan to this parable. At the time of Jesus, as we said, most Samaritans were considered bad. What if the Samaritan was good because he saw the man in the ditch and simply made the choice to come near him? The priest and the Levite gave the man in the ditch a wide berth, creating even more distance between them. But the Samaritan instead goes to him and becomes vulnerable in the closeness, opening himself to see the pain and misery in me. How often are we frightened to come close to others simply because we do not want to bear the pain or be open to the need? Several years ago, I took a year long sabbatical to explore social issue, issues in the national area. I met with the late, the late Reverend Bill Barnes. He was a retired United Methodist pastor who's well known enough that his Wikipedia says he was known as a conscious of Nashville for his civil rights, homelessness, and LGBT acts. As we discuss the focus of my sabbatical, he asked me the question, what is your proximity? He was telling me that to understand justice issues, I needed to be near people in situations, to get to know them and to be in relationship with them. I held on to this thought about the sabbatical. One place this ended up help taking me was the Tennessee Prison for Women where I ended up helping start a United Methodist worship service called Circle of Grace. And this still happened today was a gift from a woman that I mentored while she was incarcerated at that prison. And our relationship continued after she transitioned back into the community as a returning citizen. I still remember a good time we had sitting on the steps of my home a couple months after she had been released, and we gave out candy and blue bracelets for Halloween. She gave me the special gift. She had this stone made for me. If you look closely, you can see in the sign that the, the, the little circles. And it's green because the circle of Grace logo was green. I got to know her because I met her at the prison every week for almost a year. Actually, probably over a year. Probably the only thing we have in common is that we both identify our race as white and we identify as female. Our backgrounds, socioeconomic levels, family systems, you name it, are very different. But as we got to know each other, she began to trust me, and she began to share more and more about herself. Now, there were times when I wanted to say, you did what? <laughs> and other times I left the prison, sad and depressed, after hearing more about her story and her life. But over time I discovered caring person, the one who gave me this very special gift. I got to know her, the person underneath all that a lot of it, because I drew me her. I chose to be in proximity to her. We still stay in touch. Now here in St. Paul, our logo says, St. Paul United Methodist Church, a good name. This on the front of today's book. Our pride sign says, proud to be your name. So we need to ask ourselves, what is a good neighbor? Whom do we see as neighbor and whom do we overlook? Jesus didn't ask who was Samaritan's neighbor, rather he asked who acted like a neighbor. The answer, of course, is obvious. It is a Samaritan, the one who went out of his way to help another. But do you notice how this changes things? Suddenly the neighbor isn't simply the one in need, but rather the one who provides for our need, the one who takes care of us. According to Jesus, being neighbor involves not only giving help, but also being willing to receive it, even and especially to and from those we don't normally see as like us. How do we allow ourselves to receive care from the person who we disagree with the most, the person we dislike, someone we think of as enemy? The Samaritan shows us how to be a good neighbor. He sees the man in the ditch. Draws here, and then he does something about it. Often God shows up where we least expect God to be. Perhaps that's why Jesus chose the Spirit to remind the self justifying lawyer that there is no self justification possible.
because the moments we can just for ourselves, we no longer need to care about those around us. The consequence of justifying ourselves, it turns out, is to struggle to, struggle to recognize the presence of God in our neighbors and even harder in our enemies. In Friday's New York Times, Anne Lamont wrote an article about prayer and her struggles of love as God loves. If you have a chance, I encourage you to go read the entire piece. It's really good. But she says, it's miserable to be a hater. I pray to be more like Jesus with this crazy, compassionate, and reckless love. Some days they're better than others. I pray that God remembers, I pray to remember that God loves. Now here she names someone who just happens to be a politician from Georgia, but I'm going to let you fill in the blank and not call that name. And say so she goes to so and says, I pray to remember that God loves that person I struggle to love. Whatever you may think of. He loves that person exactly the same as God loves my grandson. Because God loves, period. God does not have an app for not love. God sees beyond each person's awfulness to each person's need. God loves them as he is. God is better at this than I am. And I can say that to you. When we fail to see, draw near, and help those who mistrust or fear, or just want to ignore, we risk missing the same presence of God in our lives and in the world. So who we might ask, do we have the hardest time imagining, imagining God working through? And then we should probably expect God to do just that. As theologian David Lowe says, no one is beyond God's love. No one. And so Jesus brings us home by choosing the most unlikely characters to serve as an instrument of God's mercy and grace and exemplify Christ's life behavior. That's what God does. God chooses people no one expects and does amazing things for them. Even a Samaritan. Even those we disagree with. Even those we might see as enemies. Even me. Even you. So let's strive for love and accept love. Even from those we find most difficult to see as me. Let's go and be a good neighbor.
prayer concerns that you would like to share, you can fill out a prayer request form and use and place it in the offer plate. There's also a place on our website where you can submit prayer requests. We want to be in prayer for you and for those people's situations in your lives that are in need of prayer. I know you may have been certain in your parts of mind, so I now invite you to live with any prayer concerns that you may have on your part this day. And after each petition, we'll say, Lord, hear our prayer. God of love, give us a deep love for you, so that we can see the world as you see it, feel the compassion you feel, and be a people whose lives mediate the love of others. Open our eyes that we might see what the Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the needs of others, the wisdom to know what to do, and the will to do. Gracious God, you can you know, our wounds, our hearts, and our needs, even before we know them ourselves. As the Samaritan shows compassion to the wounded man, you offer mercy to us. We pray for all those who, in many and various ways, have been stripped, beaten, and left for death. We pray for all those who have suffered violence, especially the victims of the latest mass shooting. We pray for those who might cross the road to avoid. We pray for those whose need we would rather not face up to because it requires action of us. Open our eyes that we might not cross the road in human need. Help us to be in the name. Help us to not only give help, but to also be willing to receive it. Even when it's from someone we disagree with most, it may be us in it. Give us a deep love for you that we might see your love and work in this world, and that we might go and do likewise. Bless those whose names and situations we have brought before you today for healing and hope, and for those not named in our hearts. In your mercy and love, help us to reach out to others as you have reached out to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name, be taught us to pray. Our Creator, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
announcements uh, this week. Uh, I'd like to point out that there is a uh, school supply drive uh, that will benefit uh, the Stewart Center who distribute uh, the school supplies to the Pittsburgh neighborhood. Uh, the St. Paul Youth Group will be meeting on Sunday, July 10th at the church from 5 to 7 p.m. And a very unusual activity for us uh, will be the St. Paul Zoo Day. That will be the culmination of Cassie's Wild Kingdom. And that will be uh, Sunday, July 4th at 1 p.m. Uh, are there any other announcements? If not, then we will conclude our service by singing our final hymn, which will be on page 549, where charity and love prevail. <laughs>
stuff. 